Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jeff Sue, the general manager of the Americas at Mintegral. And Mintegral is the top ad platform helping developers with UA, ad monetization, and creative services to grow their apps. We're excited to share some great insights today from our panelists, Christian Calderon, CEO of Game Jam, and Christopher Farm, CEO of Tengen. Let's start off by having our panelists give a brief introduction to themselves and their companies. Chris, can you want to start? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm the CEO of Tengen. Uh, my name is Christopher Farm. Uh, Co-founded the company in 2014. Um, we essentially try to help uh, mobile app developers scale their apps uh, to understand their return on investment, their LTV, um, and provide them with services in order to uh, grow profitably. Perfect. Hey, Christian. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah. My name is Christian Calderon. Mm -hmm. I'm the CEO at Game Jam. We are a games publisher and developer based in Vietnam. Happy to be here and uh, look forward to being on this panel with Jeff and Chris. Awesome. Well, as you guys can see, both of our panels have been in the space for some time and can share some different perspective from both a gaming developer and a measurement side of things. Let's start off with a question that is on the top of uh, many of the audience's minds. What's a good strategy to deal with Apple's SK ad network and how will working with advertisers and MMPs change? Christopher, what do you think? Yeah, sure. This is actually something that we're keenly focused on. Um, uh, for, from our perspective, you know, there's a lot of things that the technology for SK Ad Network has changed in the ecosystem. Um, I'm not going to go into all the gory details, but uh, one of the biggest things that uh, Apple has changed is the ability to do LTV and retention type of reporting. Um, on all of your campaigns. Uh, we see this as a game changer in, in the terms of technology that they've built. Um, at Tengen, we've actually focused on keeping those types of metrics around. So having the ability to uh, generate LTV and retention reports. Um, I, don't like, I don't think developers want those things to go away. I don't think it was intended for Apple to actually just dismiss them. Um, we've been focused on working directly with Apple to make sure that we can build on top of their platform uh, in a compliant way and keep providing LTV and uh, return on investment type of reports. Um, I do think that um, uh, having, in a very general sense, the way that you can kind of keep this parity is to set conversion values um, relative to the LTVs that are being produced and generated by the users on the apps. Um, and having this mapping to conversion values with your LTVs will allow you to continue um, like reporting in the way that you want to do and optimizing on the networks the way that you want to do. Um, um, so, so these are the types of things that you can do uh, in order to maintain the status mm -hmm. quo and make sure that nothing really breaks um, uh, from a measurement perspective. That's great. Yeah, I totally agree with, with what you said there. Um, as most of us have seen, the pandemic saw uh, increases of downloads for casual games skyrocket. How do you think iOS 14 will affect the casual game vertical? Let's start off with Christian on this one. Yeah, so yeah, I think the, uh, the pandemic was, you know, a terrible thing for the world, but definitely changed, um, you know, all, all of our businesses. Uh, and I think even like behavior, consumer behavior. Um, so now, you know, coming back with iOS 14, which is another huge change, uh, which is, which is going to be really interesting to see. But I think in the, in the long term, this uh, could have an effect on pr the products themselves. Um, it could open more strategies uh, for developers on how they make and develop their games, uh, how they incorporate the use of certain uh, monetization strategies and ad formats, um, and the types of games that, that uh, the developers even choose to make. Um, so I think that for both casual developers and even non-casual uh, developers, uh, so I think that this will definitely affect the, you know, 
the the vertical um and i think that uh it'll it, i think it'll be even though it will have adverse effects on businesses themselves i think it, it, there's, there's an opportunity here for casual games developers just to make better products um and so uh i think that's the you know the the, the benefit of of ios 14. Mm -hmm. agree yeah i mean from uh, i would totally echo some of those sentiments as well um like from our perspective um we see two types of uh developers try to like kind of emerging from the change of ios 14 ones that look at it plainly from the perspective of an opportunity and then ones that are kind of like in chaos mode and usually the ones in chaos mode tend to be larger companies that have like standard processes for operating you know their ltvs mm -hmm. um and the ones that look at it as an opportunity are usually the smaller uh to medium-sized game developers that are mm -hmm. growing um they see this as a way to disrupt um some of the larger companies who have like been thinking in the old way and all of their processes internally um are operating in a certain way um and as an example of this you know people talk about like the vault like how what are gonna what's gonna happen to cpms and like what's gonna happen to cpis <clears throat> um and like there's a lot of interesting data out there saying like you know facebook puts out something that's like hey cpms will drop by 50 percent on you know fan um but what we actually anticipate is something more along the lines of just higher volatility. Like um, to kind of give an example of this, it's not like the users experience anything different. Like you build a game, they still like games, like the same game. They're willing to pay for those games. It's just harder to find those people um, and target them. Um, and so what you'll, what you'll see with the smaller developers is that they, you know, they may still bid the same amount uh, as before because, you know, if they're broadly targeting people, it doesn't really change the way that they think about things. Um, but it, what it does introduce is a lot more volatility since the measurement isn't as precise. Um, so there is a good argument out there to say like CPM, so on average relatively stay the same, but you'll just get a lot more swings in volatility. Mm -hmm. um like for for those things and when there's volatility um uh just like in the stock market you can profit off of it um and a lot of the smaller and medium-sized developers plan to do exactly that um so there are strategies that can be developed and i've been seeing smaller companies develop in order to take advantage of this situation um so it's all like a matter of perspective as it comes down to you know this change yeah, I totally agree. And I, I like to add, I think we're already seeing some of these larger companies, uh, which may not have some of these assets, start to acquire these assets like uh, Azinga or EA or Embracer Group or still yeah. Uh And, you know, potentially using IDFV or other first party data benefits, um, you know, for them. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on to the next question around um, our current situation, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, will the pandemic behavior carry into 2021 as permanent pandemic-free mobile habits? Uh, will this ultimately benefit mobile for years to come? Uh, let's start with Christopher this time. Um, I, I mean, the simple answer is I think yes. I think it's changed a lot of the way that things operate. I mean, there's even some uh, um, thoughts out there where this pandemic won't actually end. Like it's just so endemic at this point that um, people will kind of have to deal with this this unfortunate you know situation for a long time. I mean, if you think about like a lot of third world countries who aren't able to get this vaccine, like you're not going to ever destroy the vaccine, uh, or sorry, destroy the disease. Um, but I do think the the pattern of you know people being more remote uh is is gonna be inherent sort of going forward um and so i don't think there will be i think there's a lot of re like remnants that'll just keep carrying through sure what do you think christian yeah no i totally agree with that i, I think um 
uh, I think definitely like people have built habits over the last uh, dur during uh, the pandemic, <laughs> and um, uh, I think you know especially within when it comes to games and, and developing games, we're building products that you know reinforce habits. So uh, I think you know a lot of the po you know positive changes that we've seen. Uh, will continue to stay within the, the gaming environment. Yeah, I totally agree. I also think that um, we've seen a, a shift towards user reliance on mobile for entertainment. Uh, games are the medium for hanging out, either Roblox and, and apps like that, or have become the social platform to interact and connect with each other. So I think you know, gaming is one of these pandemic-proof social mediums uh, that I think we'll see continue. Um, as we start 2021, many of our developers are reevaluating their current uh, monetization setups. What monetization methods do you think will be the most lucrative for developers in 2021? Uh, Christian, let's start with this one. Yeah, so I think what what uh, Farm Chris Farm said is 100% correct. Um, I think one of the 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 to, to better optimize for uh, volatility, maybe just like in the stock market, is to diversify your <laughs> your your uh, your partners, and not just the partners, but the offerings that you have. Uh, so the in terms of ad format and uh, IP offering and uh, subscription revenue. Um, mm. So I think I think that um, from a monetization perspective, uh, definitely we'll see up uh, trends happen. Um, uh, and the obvious one is, I think we'll probably see more subs subscription revenue and um, uh, uh, for, from a lot of developers, uh, apps exploring this. Um, the two new uh, ad formats that we've been seeing uh, recently is audio ads. Uh, mm -hmm. We just recently put audio ads in all of our uh, games on Android. Um, and we're seeing a lot of more uh, deep, deeper, richer native ad formats uh, emerging. Um, so I think it's you know interesting to see these these emerge. Um, I don't think they'll be uh, as as big as you know rewarded video or interstitial still, uh, but I, I do think that we will see a little bit of increase in revenue from some alternative formats. Not a huge, in my opinion, not a, not huge, but we will see some. Mm -hmm more revenue come from these formats. Sure, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think if you can provide enough value for a subscription, uh, that's a good model. Um, users are not going out as much, not spending as much on uh, outside entertainment, so they may have extra funds to find that value at home through your subscription. Um, I think other than that, IP and uh, ads are gonna be the way to go. Uh, I think for ads, um, I think we'll see more developers test banner ads. Uh, and I think we'll look towards having a higher uh, brand ad to game ad ratio uh, by doing that. Um, the next question we have is, is around the pandemic as well, specifically around subscriptions. Um, you know, subscriptions are up a lot. Um, do you think this will continue? And what verticals do you think um, stand to benefit from, you know, these increased subscriptions? Um, I'll start by saying, you know, the the learning and entertainment apps are, are obviously up. Um, I've had a few personal subscriptions myself. Um, you know, the top one, top verticals that I see are, are around dating and, and streaming, whether that be YouTube or uh, YouTube Premium is, is pretty amazing. Uh, Disney Plus, uh, and then, you know, Tinder and, and Bumble and, and apps like that. Um, what are your thoughts, Christian? Well, I personally, I've been dating less because of COVID, but uh, but I think yeah, no, I think from 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 a gaming perspective, um, you know, I I think that again, like these are reinforced learn, uh, habits that we're building, and uh, subscription revenue will remain strong within the gaming vertical. Um, I can't speak to any other verticals, but I, I do think it'll continue to grow. Awesome, and. Next question is around um, App Clips, which was introduced uh, last year. Do you think the uh, Apple's introduction of App Clips on iOS 14 will be lucrative for app developers in 2021? Uh, I personally think that this could be useful for retail, uh, mainly to reduce the friction and, and increase throughput for, for tickets within restaurants and things like that. 
uh, like providing a menu or uh, the ability to order online um, through mobile. Uh, I think through a gaming lens, as we approach iOS 14 and some of the limitations on around IDFA, marketers are going to have to be more creative around how to obtain users for effective costs. So I think with app clips, marketers can utilize NFC or QR codes at physical locations um, and recommend that users fill their time by playing, you know, their apps or, or at least a portion of their apps, like, uh, you know, putting QR codes in like buses or subways or airports or things like that. I also think that you may be able to use uh, app clips for Apple Maps and, and recommend that users discover um, your app at physical locations, either tying in IP to physical world events like the NBA or something like that. Um, in do, regards to, yep. Do you see regions where this could pop up, like start popping off earlier? Because I, you know, with QR codes, like it was pretty absent in the US, but when I yeah. came to Asia, was, I felt like a lot more people were using it. You think we'd see something similar with the, um, with the app clips? Yeah, very true. I think uh, Asia is, is big on QR codes and, you know, China specifically, but I think, you know, some of the early case studies for, for Apple app clips have been in, in uh, APAC and Japan, um, where I think, you know, the functionality is just there um, and the ecosystem is there. Uh, in regards to monetization, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about decreased uh, CPMs and things like that. What you know, Christopher said uh, earlier. Do you foresee lower CPMs due to difficulties in identifying uh, and targeting users? Uh, so let's start with uh, Chris on this. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the 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 most popular answer out there is that yes, CPMs will decrease. <clears throat> um, but I'm slowly becoming, you know, quite, I'm slowly questioning that argument. You know, like um, Facebook Audience Network has said that, you know, they're going to expect to see like 50% decrease in CPMs. Um, but I think this is too generic for a lot of the developers here. Usually, usually developers will focus on a specific area uh, of the market and those CPMs drastically differ, mm -hmm. like the way that they operate than another area of the market. So like, um, um, for example, like casual, casual gaming is very different than hyper casual gaming, right? Where, uh, um, usually casual games will want to hyper target their users and they're willing to pay more for them. So in a scenario like this, where they don't have the ability to measure, um, uh, target or like measure the actual ROI on, you know, hyper targeted campaigns, what they could do is like create more broadly targeted campaigns and just bid lower. So like maybe one out of the 10 people uh, will be like a good user to buy. Then you just account for that in the math. So the CPMs should roughly net out to the same thing. You just get about, you just get more volatility there. Um, and so um, this, this broad targeting category also just has more supply or like, sorry, more demands, like more people want to bid in a broader targeted category. So you you might even argue that the hyper casual space would see like an increase in the amount of demand for their inventory because it's all broadly targeted. Um, and as a result of this, you, you might even make the argument that CPMs could increase. Um, so as a result of this, like, there's all these like, competing thoughts and even at, we, we even at Tangent have some data that shows, you know, CPMs in general have been slowly increasing as uh, like people have less tracking. Um, and as a result of this, you kind of wonder, like, why is it that someone like Fan would say like there's a drop in 50 percent? CPMs, mm -hmm. you know, they have like a completely, they have a super large business. So you have to think about it this way, right? Um, so they may see an overall drop, but in certain areas of the market, you may actually see increases. Um, so it's really hard to answer very precisely with such like a generic question. Um, but I do think there, there will actually be increases in some areas. Um, even though the overall market may just like pull back simply because, um, you know, of different types of businesses out there. Um, um, yeah, that's that's kind of the the thought. It's interesting. Yeah, hundred percent. 
Yeah, 100% agree with that. I think there's a couple of things to think about. One is like thinking about this on a gross basis and then on a net basis, right? Mm -hmm. On a gross basis, I agree that, you know, CPMs will continue to increase as ad spend increases and smartphone penetration stays the same. I mean, these have been the macroeconomic drivers bringing CPMs up that are not changing, right? There, people will still use phones. Ad spend mm -hmm. will still come in, uh, I, I strongly believe. The, the one thing to think about is like, if people are uh, spe like as advertisers and we're trying to create learnings, I mean, we all know that sometimes we have to spend more to, to, to learn. So in theory, that should increase uh, on a broader basis um, uh, in uh, C CPMs. Uh, the question is, is like on a net basis, how it, you know, uh, will the developers see, uh, see that? Um, and so I think it depends on each developer and it depends on each network that you work with. So I think some networks, hmm. we could see stronger CPMs uh, than others. And then those networks will also have to compete, right? And so if you have a, a, a diversified uh, waterfall, um, in theory, the supply and demand, you know, sit in the competition hmm. is relatively strong, then uh, the, the net effect of the CPM um, should continue to drive up in the long term, in my opinion. Yeah. 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 Like the popular answer, you know, if you ask someone randomly in the industry is definitely yes, CPMs will decrease because everyone's scared about losing targeting and whatnot. But the reality is like Facebook doesn't really lose its targeting on its O and O properties. It's like they still <laughs> if they show you an ad on their Facebook newsfeed, they know who you are. They can tell you like this person's male, they live in San Francisco, yada, yada, yada. So you can still hyper-target with on a CPM basis. The measurement becomes a little bit harder and more difficult um, in terms of like, okay, now we have to do a little bit more uh, data analysis. Maybe it takes like a couple of days because of SCAD network's ability to send post facts, um, all of those like individual things. But the net of the situation is like, are you really going to change your targeting still exists on something like Facebook. Um, um, there's also other competing factors, right? Like SK Ad Network in iOS 14 allows you to actually get an App Store ID as a source ID. So before on every ad network, you would have like this obscure site ID that's only like sort of within that network. But now Apple actually provides you like an actual App Store ID. So you can go across like different networks now with the same ID. Um, and that's like a game changer that I think is kind of like missing in a lot of the conversations I've seen with SK Ad Network is like, there's a lot of hate about SK Ad Network, but there are some like areas of opportunity where if you actually learn about things like this, like smaller and medium sized developers can take advantage of that. Um, like think of it, think, Think about the way it works right now, Christian. Like you have this like obscure site ID with um, some ad network. You don't know how to use that and buy that same site in another network. Um, whereas now, you know, Apple actually provides that to you. Um, so you can actually go into another network and like target even better than before. Um, so there are a lot of like competing factors. Um, that I think are missing and will will be slowly revealed as people build solutions around this. And I think eCPMs though, in general, like I think there's a really good argument to see that it stays the same or increases in some cases. Um, yeah, that's just my opinion. Yeah. Awesome. I think it, based on the network too, it'll change, right? I think. Mm -hmm. yep. Uh, just to give a quick quick shout out to Minigrel, I mean, Minigrel has like so many awesome ad formats, always innovating on ad formats. So I think like, you know, like you, we should still see strong CPMs on, on Minigrel because there's still innovation at that ad format level. Um, but with another network, you may not see the same level of innovation and you may see, you know, CPMs drop. Um, but little shout out there for you guys. Totally agree. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. we're we're definitely trying to innovate on on that. I think that's you know one of the areas where the performance can improve. Obviously, creative heading into iOS fourteen is another one. Um, you know, kind of with the, the the targeting and the ad performance and creative um, and more of this potential broad targeting. Do you guys foresee brands utilizing casual games in their advertising mix? Um, you know, post iOS fourteen, 
Uh, Christian, what do you think? Yeah, I, I do. We're, we're even already starting to get uh, inbound interest from, from brands. Um, and so more, more now than ever before. Hmm. Um, so I, I, I do think that that will continue to be a trend um, with brands. Very much. What do yeah, you I can see. I can see both sides. Like, um, I think in areas where brands see like decreases, they might certainly be more interested in that. And in areas where they see like increases, they'll be a little bit more cautious. Um, um, I personally don't have. I, I don't have like as a complete view as someone like Christian though, because he's on the front lines dealing with the brands themselves. Um, since we're more of like just helping them measure things. Um, but like from my perspective, I think they'll just follow, follow the money. Uh, and like, if there's, if there's money to be made in certain areas, um, they'll just go after it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I think, you know, on our side, we're, we're seeing a slight uptick in you know, some brand DSPs that are, that are looking to, to access inventory. So I think that will probably increase as well. Hmm. Even uh, the even the games we're making branded games, you know, more. Mm -hmm. and I think we're seeing more of them now than ever before, and it'll mm -hmm. continue to be a trend this year. Um, and so I think the brands not just coming in on the advertising side, but also coming into the games themselves, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and coming coming into gaming more, I think is going to be continue to be a trend. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, that's very interesting that you guys are um, working on those types of uh, branded games. Um, let's go to the next question around, um, you know, monetization around, um, the, I guess the old school waterfall and, and what's, you know, relatively new is, is in app bidding, or at least developers utilizing bidding. Um, how fast do you think iOS 14 will accelerate the shift from waterfall to in-app bidding? Um, I'll just start by saying that we've seen a lot of developers, you know, already test bidding, uh, across many different bidding platforms. I think you'll also see an increase of networks that are bidding now versus last year. There's quite a few more this year, uh, which is increasing the bid density and ultimately is better for the ecosystem and, and developers as a whole. Um, Christian, what are, what are you seeing at Game Jam? Yeah, I think, you know, like two years ago when you would do a test, like a waterfall would often outperform bidding mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with the early networks. Um, uh, but now we're starting to see uh, bidding uh, on par or outperform uh, waterfall. Um, and so I think it's, you know, that shift will continue to accelerate. Uh, the question I do have is with, with the level of volatility, um, will it be better to have uh, fixed pricing in the waterfall system? Um, so I'm, I, if there's an increase in volatility and you can have more control over your price ranges within the waterfall with fixed pricing, that might be some control over the volatility. Um, so that's the only question I have with bidding um, uh, because, you know, with bidding, it could rap rapidly, the bidding could, CPMs could rapidly go down, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so having a little more control over the waterfall Obviously, you could have floors in place and things like that if we yeah. want to jump into the technicals. But having a little more control of the waterfall might be an interesting thing to test in a iOS 14 environment. Also, different price ranges depending on LAT versus non-LAT users. So um, I think it'll still be an interesting thing to test. Um, but my guess is it'll rapidly continue to increase towards bidding. Yeah, I totally agree. That's that's exactly what we're seeing on our side too. Um, it's almost all new integrations are, are utilizing bidding at this point. So um, that's great. Um, now to uh, our final question around privacy and transparency, which is, a, which is another hot topic kind of leading into iOS 14. Um, the importance of privacy and transparent, uh, transparency is now fully recognized by the industry. How are ad platforms responding in order to comply and get on board while still remaining competitive? Um, Christopher, I think you have some good insight on this. So let's start there. Yeah, sure. Um, there's a lot of like um, FUD out there, and it, it's it's really actually. I mean, if you're kind of just sitting on the sidelines and watching all of this unfold, it's it's probably really entertaining. Um, um, from the perspective, I mean, we talk with Apple a lot about this, um, especially because we're 
continuing to build on their ecosystem with SCAD network. Um, they're basically very strong footed about fingerprinting. Like their stance on it is you'll basically be blocked at some point in time um, after iOS 14.5 if you continue to just do fingerprinting. Um, uh, and so there's there's a lot of talk about like how do you how do you combat that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of like other um, there's a lot of sort of like content in the market as well where they're trying to say like oh it's not fingerprinting it's probabilistic and it's like this is this is like Apple doesn't care uh, what you call it. Um, and so what what are people going to do about this? I think you know the main thing is. If you build on top of this is what Apple says directly to us is like if you build on SK Ad Network the way that it's designed you won't have to worry about being compliant or not and so this is the stance that we take uh, and like everything that we continue to build will be on SK Ad Network um, and we will try to continue providing the same functionality around LTV and retention and all the same metrics that you know app developers care about. This is the hard part about um, the change for a lot of companies is they don't know how to like make that transition. Um, but I do believe the entire industry will make that transition. Um, and I do think that the ad platforms will understand um, the perspective that comes from it as well. Um, uh, it'll just take some time, but I do think that it'll happen. Um, optimization purposes for specifically for ad networks. Um, there are systems that we've built that work with conversion values and have been tested with those ad networks. Um, their systems aren't built for it yet. Like the ad networks themselves have to like do some tweaking, but more or less like there will we'll get to a stable point where you can still optimize on in a in a privacy focused manner. Um, um, yeah, that's that's kind of the short answer. I could talk about this question for a really long time, though. Great, thanks thanks for the insight. That's very very insightful for um, you know how I think the industry is going to approach this and how we're all trying to you know figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, and you know people are scurrying, so I think it is um, something that is very top of mind. Um, with that being our last question, I think we can go through um, some of the audience questions that have come in. Um, one of the questions that we have here is, what will you think will be the impact of SKI network on mobile web traffic? The impact of SKI network on mobile web traffic. So like from web to app, like is, is that the question? Um, um, I don't think that it'll slow down at all. Like it may even increase, like if people want to continue like going down the road route of like deterministic type of attribution. Um, um, by deterministic, I, I also don't use, <laughs> I use it in a way where it's like you tie like a specific ID, we'll call it IDFV to like a specific campaign. Um, that to me is deterministic because it's 100% attributable in that case, regardless of like if you did fingerprinting or not, like that is deterministic to me. Um, the way SK Ad Network changes this is you can no longer like link them this way. And how we think about, we're starting to think about things is like, what is the probability that someone came from a campaign versus another campaign? And um, this is like the type of technology that we're developing. Um, and that's what we actually mean by probabilistic as well. It's not like fingerprinting. It's actually being like, what is the probability given all the different signals and machine learning that you can do? Um, in terms of like getting back to this question though, like mobile web traffic, I don't see that decreasing or increasing all that much if you want to play by Apple's rules. Um, I think there are certainly be people who try to do it more because they're so reliant on this deterministic way of things. But talking to Apple, I think they're going to just slowly crack it down. Um, I mean, some of my exper historical experience on the way Apple operates as well is very biased. Like I used to be at Tapjoy. I was like one of their first PMs there. And like there, when UDID was deprecated and, you know, they were really against incent installs and banning, you know, Tapjoy from the app store and all that kind of stuff. Like they're really hard nosed about whenever they take a stance like this. 
Um, and so my bias is to always play by their rules um, and make sure that it works because you always just get risk, get the risk of getting banned or like not being able to submit your app, which you never ever want. Um, so that's just my my personal bias is to play by the rules. Got it. Well, speaking of Apple, there's another question um, uh, in in the chat which talks about um, what's your take on Apple and the Epic battle, and kind of what are the ramifications for the, the industry, uh, you know, based <laughs> on what's going on there. Yeah, I mean that that exact that that goes with the question of like playing by their rules, right? It's like like some people don't like that. Um, <laughs> uh, that's that's not that's kind of the short sentence on the Apple Epic. Thing. It's like, you know, is Apple so dominant uh, that they can kind of do whatever they want? And kind of the answer is yes. Like if you're if you're grounded in reality and you want to submit an app to their app store, you kind of have to play by their rules at this point in time. Uh, I have my own personal opinions, but I won't muddy the water in terms of like uh, like my own personal thoughts there. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's it's an um interesting and and super sensitive topic it what what i think will be interesting to see from apple's side uh from from this is um if they will change uh the services in any way uh to validate um the margin that they're that they're taking um it could be interesting to see if they if they if they do anything like that um I thought that the move for you know small businesses, uh, the initiative for small businesses was was great, and we wouldn't have seen that if we didn't see uh, pushback from Epic. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's positive a positive side that you know someone is um, you know, stepping up and and you, even though that you know uh, I I can't speak too much about Epic and in the lawsuit, but just the fact that Apple did. Like as Chris said, they're very hard nosed about these changes, and so that they did make a change for small business. I think is is a huge, a huge win for small businesses. Um, so hopefully, we see more changes like this in the future. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing the the insight there. I totally agree. I think it was a a great move, um, both for small businesses, just optically for Apple, um, based off of their history. Um, so we'll see how that kind of plays out with um, other larger studios, which may encounter the same thing. Um, well, I think with that, we're, we're basically up on time. Um, I'd like to thank everybody uh, from around the world for joining today. I'd also like to thank our, our great panelists with the great insights that they shared today. Thank you, Christian and, and Christopher. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys in the next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you guys.